perfect so today we will talk about joint distribution so the idea of joint distribution is sometimes you have multiple random variables all of which are related to each other in some way so if you look at the velocity of the vehicle uh, so each vehicle has rotation sensors on the wheel which measures the speed the rotational speed of the wheels and then you have the velocity of the vehicle do you think that the velocity of the vehicle has relationship with the rotation rotational speed of the wheels right so it is because uh, you can multiply the rotational speed of the wheel with the radius of the wheel and you get some idea of what the velocity of the vehicle is going to be. Same way, if you look at four wheels of a vehicle or maybe eight wheels of a truck, all of them will have rotation sensors of its own. So you have like four rotation sensors and the velocity of the vehicle and the velocity of the vehicle and all the four rotation sensors, whatever the output of the rotation sensors are, all of them have some relationship with each other. In the ideal world scenario, we would like all the four rotation sensors of the wheel to give you the same reading, the same rotational speed. But actually in real world, that's not going to happen. All the four sensors will give you some rotational speed, but these, those speeds are going to be very close to each other because we'll of course assume that there's no slipping at the wheel. Sometimes you can have slipping at the wheel, in which case one of the rotations will be higher, the other rotation is going to be lower. And what light turns on in the vehicle when that happens? Anyone knows? What happens if one wheel's rotation sensor is very, is giving a reading which is very different from the other wheel rotation sensor? Fall. Sorry? Fall. Not fall. So there is some light that turns on in the vehicle. Uh, Something related to ABS, basically it, it is the, uh, the yeah, so the, the basically the snow, whenever there is snow on the road, then in that case, you know, one of the wheels, if it gets stuck in the snow, the rotation is very high. The other wheel, which is on the ground, the rotation will be very low. And in those cases, you will see that there is some, some sensor that turns on, which basically says that you are, your, your wheels are slipping. So sometimes when there is a mismatch between so you expect two random variables to have similar values, but if there is a huge mismatch between those values, then you can turn on a sensor and you can alert the driver that something is going wrong. So joint distribution basically is a way to understand how the two random variables or multiple random variables, not just two, but maybe like 10, 15, 20, 1000 random variables relate to each other. So typically, in joint distribution, you have omega. So let's, let's pick a simple example. You can have head and tails, cross head and tails. And so you can have like x1 of omega, which is omega 1, x2 of omega, which is omega 2. OK? Or you can have omega, which is r cross r. And you can have x1 of omega equals to omega 1 and x2 of omega equals to omega 2. So you can have like very different ways of, oh, actually x1 is supposed to be a variable. So we can't really put omega 1 here, but we might have to put some function of omega 1 and some function of omega 2. So that way these are real these are real values okay we want these random variables to have real values <clears throat> so the way to measure uh, of course there will be some distribution on on uh, x1 and x2 and the way we will denote that distribution so let's do the, for discrete case we will use p x1 equals to x1 x2 equals to x2. There will be some number for x1, x2 pair, x1 prime, x2 prime pair, and so on. Okay, that's known as a joint, this is known as a joint distribution.
So in the case of uh, vehicle, you will have probability of velocity, joint distribution velocity, rotation sensor 1, rotation sensor 2, rotation sensor 3, rotation sensor 4. And you will have a bunch of uh, numbers which is basically telling you what's the joint distribution of these four, these five uh, variables together. So joint uh, probability distribution also has to satisfy all the conditions of probability distribution except that uh, the uh, event A will be a subset of this, uh, these uh, joint sets, not joint sets, but the product of sets. Okay, so A could have, A has to have tuple. If I have A as a subset of omega, then A would be something like H H so omega so A will be a subset of H H H T T H and T T okay so but it has to satisfy even the joint distribution has to satisfy all those conditions Remember what those conditions were? The probability of A has to be greater than or equal to zero and probability of A has to be less than or equal to one. Probability of omega should be equal to one and if AI disjoint, then probability of union of AI equals to summation of probability of AI. These three conditions have to be satisfied even for uh, these kind of uh, systems. This is by the way countable, countable number of sets. So these conditions needs to be satisfied for this particular joint distribution as well. And just so you know, uh, This is same as saying that probability of x1, x2 equals to x1, x2. Okay, so sometimes we will write it like this, sometimes we will write it like this, but they mean the same thing. Okay, I'll take any questions. How many of you have seen joint distribution before? No? No? Okay. This is joint distribution. We'll do a example now. Let's think about it. So I have this room uh, in the building and maybe there is like DL260 is right next door. So we have two rooms. DL260 is somewhat larger room. This one is somewhat smaller room. DL260 can accommodate, if I'm not mistaken, about 70 people. This room can accommodate 40 people. Okay, now let's look at the temperature of DL260 and temperature of DL264, which is this particular room. So how do we think about probability in this case? So I have, let's say X1 is temperature of 
DL260, which is right next door, and X2 is temperature of DL264. Um, what should my omega be? What do you think is the temperature range of DL260? Maybe 69 to 74, and the same thing here. 69 to 74 cross 69 to 74. Okay, that's the temperature range of both these rooms. Let's try to figure out what the joint distribution is. Let me try to keep it discrete. I, uh, maybe I'll get into the continuous one in a bit. So for now, we'll just keep it discrete. So I have 69, 70, 70. OK, that's my omega. So what is the probability that x1 equals to 69 and x2 equals to 69? So throughout the year, so we have like, I don't know, 365 days in a year. And uh, each of these sensors are measuring the temperature every second. Let's say that's what the frequency of measuring temperature is. So, the free, so we are collecting 86,400 temperature measurements every day. And we have 365 days in a year, so we are measuring, I don't know, how much that is? How much is that? 36 million. So we are collecting about 36 million data points from this room and that room at the same time, okay? What is the percentage? So out of those 36 million readings that we have, how many times do we see 69 temperature of room 1 to be 69 and temperature of room 2 to be 69? So let's say that is equal to 0 0.05. So about 5% of the time, the temperature of this room is 69 and the temperature of that room is also 69. X1 equals to 70, X2 equals to 69. Out of those 36 million readings, what percentage of reading, in what percentage of data, you see that the temperature of DL260 is 70, but the temperature of this room is 69. Okay, so whatever, it will be like 0 0.01. So 1% of the time, the temperature of DL260 is higher, the temperature of this particular room is 69. And I can keep, Specifying these numbers all the way until I cover the entire set omega, making sure that these all add up to 1, because that's the requirement. P of omega must be equal to 1. So how many, how many of these joint probability measures, uh, joint uh, values will we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we'll have 36. We'll have 36 such values. All of which, if you, if you add all, all of these variables up, it'll turn out to be equal to one. Okay, so that's how you get the probability, the joint measure. You look at the two random variables and you figure out at what point of time uh, like you, you, you have the set omega, so you create all these individual sets from omega, uh, the set omega, and then you try to specify, okay, what is the, um, what percentage of data set has these values, what percentage of data set has these values, what percentage of data set has these values, and so on and so forth. That's how you get the joint measure. Any question? Yes. 0 0.05, uh, can you explain how we got 0.05 and 0 0.05? So, okay, good. So we have 36 million data points, right? 
uh, what is 5% of 36? Let's say the 6969 pair in that data set is 5% of 36 million. How much is that? 1.8 million, right? So when you look at the 36 million, the data set of 36 million entries, you see 6969 appearing 1.8 million times. You see uh, 0. Point, you see this particular 7069 appears 0. 0.36 million times. You and just so, take an, like you just took an example of saying it's, a, it's occurring 1%, right? I'm just, yeah, 1% of the time. Yeah, I'm just telling you exactly from this 36 million data set, how do you get these values? Okay, you just count. You just count and then you plug in the number based on so what when percent. Do, when I have like two different data and I need to sit and sort it out like how many... You will have to sort it, it out, yes. Yes, you will have to sort it out. There are 36 entries here. So this is six and this is six. So jointly there are 36 possibilities. So you'll have to sort the data, filter out possibility one, possibility two, possibility three, figure out how many times it is happening, then divide it by the total number of data points. You get this number, you get this number, and so on and so forth. That's how you get the, yeah. And then all of it will turn out to be equal to one because that's how you are constructing those numbers. Okay, any other question? Okay, so when you have joint distribution, you are also interested in knowing uh, the distribution of x1 and the distribution of x2, and you want to figure out what is the relation between x1 and x2. Just like I said, velocity of a vehicle is very closely related to the radius of the, uh, of the tires multiplied by the rotational speed of the tires. So you want to figure out some of these relationships from the data set itself. So how do you do that? You need to compute what is known as a marginal distribution and the conditional distribution. So now I have computed these values. Marginal on x1 is p1 x1 equals to x1 equals to summation over all x2 of p x1 equals to x1 x2 equals to x2. So if I sum over the entire x2, I get the marginal on x1. This is the marginal distribution on x1. Same way, we can define the marginal distribution on x2. That is p2 of x2 equals to x2 summation x1 So I look at the data set, I come up with these values, uh, the joint distribution. Now by averaging, I mean I'm not really averaging, I'm just summing up 
over the entire x2, I get the marginal distribution on x1. I sum up over the entire x1, I get the marginal distribution on x2, or marginal distribution on the second uh, random variable. And you can define it, you can define it in the same way for multiple random variables. That is, this distribution, P1, is basically equal to what's the probability in the data set, how many times do you see x1 equals to 69? So remember that the number of times you see p of x1 equals to 69 is the same as probability of, I'm just going to write 69, 69, plus probability of 69, 70, plus probability of 69, 71, 6974. Right, so you look at the joint distribution, you add up all the values of x2, and then you get what's the probability that you will have 69 degrees Fahrenheit in DL 260. Okay, that's just the definition. This is the definition of marginal distribution. You are just adding up. So if you want to find out the marginal distribution on X1, you average out all the other random variables. I mean, I'm, okay, I'm not saying average out. You just sum up over the joint distribution over all the other random variables. So if you had X3 as well, so you will, you will put X3 here and then you will sum over all X2 and X3. Uh, let me write down that particular expression. Any, any questions so far before I talk about marginals on multiple spaces? So if I want to find marginals on X1, and you have joint distribution over x2 and x3, you can write it this way, x2 and x3. On the other hand, if you want marginal on one and two, you just sum it up over all x3. and so on. You can keep doing that for all of the other. So you have one and two here, and you sum it over x3 here. And you get the frequency of x1 and x2 appearing together in the data set. How many times, or what percentage of time x1 and x2 appears together in the data set? Going back to the example of this university, we have 40,000 temperature sensors across all the rooms in the university. Um, remember that OSU is not a single campus. We have like multiple campuses. When I'm talking about the Columbus campus, we'll have something roughly around 40,000 such uh, temperature sensors. So we'll have X1, X2, X3, all the way up to X40,000. Okay, so we have like 40,000 readings. Each of these readings are being taken every one minute. So we'll have this uh, frequency of what are these readings uh, at every one minute interval for the entire year or maybe for the entire one decade. And so that gives us the joint distribution. And then from each of those joint distribution, I can find out what the marginal distribution is. Okay. So is the concept of marginal clear? It's basically how many tuple, how many times this number is appearing in the data set? How many times or what percentage of time these, uh, these uh, two numbers are appearing in the data set together? So that's what is basically the marginal distribution. And then the third part that I want to talk about is conditional. So we talked about joint distribution, we talked about marginal distribution. Now we need to talk about conditional distribution.
So the idea of conditional distribution is that if I know the temperature of this room, can I say something about the temperature of DL260? So I'm sitting in DL264, I'm observing what the temperature here is. What can I say about the temperature of DL260? Or if you're looking at the velocity of the vehicle on the dashboard, what can you say about the rotational speed of the wheel of the vehicle? Uh, where else? Uh, what are the other cases where you have you're observing something in a limited context and you want to know what might be happening somewhere else. What's the other scenario? If you know the prices of McDonald's burgers in a McDonald, can you say something about prices of Subway sandwiches? Okay, that's another conditional distribution question. So you're observing something in a limited context and you want to get some idea about what might be happening uh, in other areas which you are not directly able to observe, okay? So the way conditional, is so for, in order to compute conditional distribution, you need to have the joint distribution and then you need to have the marginal distribution. So here is how we define conditional distribution. P of x2 equals to x2, given x1 equals to x1. P1 of x1. So this is joint over marginal. So this is known as x2 given x1. This is, uh, or, or in other words, x2 conditioned on x1. So these are all, uh, the, uh, these are all the, the nomenclature for this particular statement. What's the probability of x2 given x1? Or what's the probability of x2 conditioned on x1? So you take the joint distribution and you divide it by the marginal, where the marginal is the conditioning variable, the random variable over which you are conditioning. What this tells you is I am observing x1. X1 is what I see, what I can feel. But I want to know what X2 is, okay? And this one is giving you a belief over what potentially X2 could be. So to give you an example, I looked at the data set of the temperature of DL260 and 264, and I found out that out of those 36 million uh, values, I've never had this combination. That the temperature of this room is 74 degrees Fahrenheit, but the temperature of DL260 is 69 degrees Fahrenheit. So I've looked at 36 million values, and this pair has never appeared in that entire data set. So this joint distribution is equal to zero. Now the question is, if you want to find out what's the probability of 74 given 69, okay, so we look at the numerator, numerator is zero, and denominator could be anything, I don't care, but this is zero. So if I'm observing, So if I'm observing that in DL260, I'm sitting in DL260, and I'm observing that temperature is 69 degrees Fahrenheit, I know for sure 
that in this room, the temperature cannot be 74, because that's what the conditioning, conditional distribution is telling us. That the probability that x2 is, 60, x, is 74, given x1 is 69, is actually equal to 0, which means if I'm observing the temperature of DL260 and it is uh, 69 degrees Fahrenheit, it's impossible for this room's temperature to be 74 degrees Fahrenheit. You can be a bit more, uh, you, can, you can go to any level of complication here. So let me tell you a more complicated definition, not definition, I mean it follows from the same expression, but you could also have situations where You want to find out this conditional distribution. So x1 is in set A1, whereas x2 is in set A2. This is again given by the joint distribution. So this is for one individual value. And this one is for the set notation, if A1 and A2 are general sets. Then how do you compute this conditional distribution? This is how you do it. Okay, so let me ask you a question, going back to the example of this room. Uh, there is a smoke sensor right there in, in this room, and then we have a temperature sensor. Do you think that the temperature sensor of the thermostat and the smoke sensor that we have, do you think they have a correlation? Do you think that they are related? What's your thoughts? What are your thoughts on this? Why? Uh, let's say if there's a fire. Correct. 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 That means there might, there's a rise in temperature. That's right. There will be a rise in temperature and the temperature sensor will pick it up. So in general, the two sensors are completely uncorrelated, which means that the temperature is independent of the smoke. Uh, however, in some cases, the two becomes correlated. That in correlated means there is a relationship. One is if there is fire in the room, Second is if someone is cooking in the room or somebody is, I don't know, having a cigarette or whatever, smoking in the room. So in those cases, the smoke sensor is going to smoke some, uh, is going to sense uh, some sort of, uh, uh, it'll pick up some, some uh, uh, smoke inside the room. But then uh, in the case of fire, so if you're cooking, you probably will not increase the temperature that much, maybe you can, but in those cases, of course, there is some correlation. In the case of fire, there is a very strong correlation. And in the case of smoking inside the room, only the smoke sensor will turn on, but the temperature sensor is not going to turn, like temperature is not going to change significantly. So sometimes you might have, so I, even though I'm talking about, uh, in this case, X1 and X2 is basically temperature of two separate rooms, sometimes you also have, you can have multiple sensors and all those sensors might also have some correlation or may not have correlations in some region, but we will have correlation in some other region of omega. So, some things to keep in mind that, uh, uh, that in the context of autonomous system, uh, you could have multitude of sensors, and each of the sensor is giving you some information, and that information may be correlated, may not be correlated. And you will have to know it from the context of that system. So in the case of an aircraft, the engine has temperature sensor, but the aircraft also has pitot tubes, which is basically the velocity sensor of the aircraft. And so the velocity sensor and the temperature sensors are completely uncorrelated there. What the engine is doing and what the velocity of the aircraft is, uncorrelated um, in those cases. So how do you measure this notion that sometimes things are correlated, sometimes one sensor can give you information about the other sensor. 
Oh, one sensor reading can give you information about the other sensor reading. And in some other case, one sensor reading cannot give you any information about the other sensor reading. So that is measured by what is known as independence, the notion of independence. So let me talk about independence between random variables. Is the conditional distribution clear? Any questions on the conditional? No. So x1 and x2 are independent random variables if and only if p of x1 equals to x1, x2 equals to x2, p1 of x1, p2 of x2 for all x1, x2. So joint equals to product of marginals. And you can have multiple such random variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, and all that. And if the joint distribution is equal to the product of marginals, then these random variables are independent. So the temperature of DL260 and DL264, because we are part of the same building, we can never have independence. However, the temperature of DL260 and the temperature of, let's go to the medical center, something happening in medical center, so those two are distinct buildings, those two are separate buildings. The temperature might be independent of each other. So the temperature of that room can be independent of the temperature of this particular room in this building. So that's the notion of independence. Independence says that actually X1 and X2 has, if you look at the number of times X1 and X2 appears, it's actually equal to the number of times X1 appears or fraction of time x1 appears multiplied by the fraction of times x2 appears. And this should hold true, by the way, this statement should hold true for all x1 and x2. So going back to the example of the smoke detector versus the temperature sensor here, so under normal conditions, like right now, the two are completely uncorrelated, okay? So for these values of x1 and x2, you will see that the joint is equal to the product of marginal for some values of x1 and x2. But under some extreme cases, for some small number of situations in omega, actually this condition doesn't hold true, in which case we can't really say that the two sensor readings are independent random variables because there are conditions, there are situations where these two become correlated and the joint is no longer product of marginal. Any other uh, situations where you have independence? So how much groceries I buy in a week and how much groceries you buy in a week, completely uncorrelated. They, because they're all independent. So if we look at how much I spend on grocery and how much you spend on grocery and we create like a table, Excel file for every week, most likely, it will be the product of marginal, okay? Most likely. Uh, because we both are different individuals. There's nothing that correlates our consumption pattern. On the other hand, if you look at, so grocery is one, one category in which we spend money, but if we look at the spend category of uh, number of uh, jackets we buy in a month, okay? there will be a very strong correlation because weather is causing correlation among our buying pattern of jackets, okay? So when the winter comes, we all go and buy jackets. When the summer comes, we stop buying jackets, right? So sometimes when you have, when this condition is violated, 
uh, it's good to think about what could be affecting the two readings, the two, two outputs, or two random variables, that is correlating the two random variables. So they are no longer independent. Any other situation where independence appears? Uh, temperature of Mars versus temperature on Earth. You know, th those are uncorrelated. Or maybe they are correlated, I don't know. It seems likely that they are uncorrelated, but maybe they are, I don't know. Yes? Is it possible that the point equals to zero when the two variables are independent? Uh, joint can not be, all the joints, so remember this, this has to happen for all x1, x2 pair. So you can have some joint is equal to zero, but you can't have all joints equal to zero. Right. It might be zero. Like the That's right. So perfect. So let's look at this case. Okay. So maybe P of 69, P1 of 69 is 0 0.2, P2 of 74 is 0 0.1. So now the joint is no longer product of marginal. What is product of marginal at 0 0.02? The joint is equal to zero. Therefore, x1 and x2 are not independent, okay? They are correlated. Okay, so here joint is not equal to product of marginals. So let's do uh, an example, a concrete example that will help us understand these concepts better. In order to keep things tractable, I'm going to assume only two variables. And each of them can take only two values. Okay. So omega equals to 69.70 cross 69.70. Okay. So P of 69.69, P of 69.70, P of 70.69, P of 70. 70. Can you guys give me some numbers so as to do the calculations on the board? Just come up with some arbitrary numbers. I don't care what those numbers are. We'll just do things by hand. 70. How much? 25. 25. That'll make it very boring. <laughs> <laughs> so 0.1 and 0.4. 0.4, 0.15. No, 1.5 will make it more complicated. 0.1. 0 0.25. 1.5 actually makes sense. If you make 0.15 and 0.2, that will make sense. OK. The multiplications might become difficult, but it's OK. We'll, we'll figure things out. If we need, we'll use the calculator. Okay, so we have the joint distribution uh, for these two random variables. Now let's find out what P1 of 69 is. What is P1 of 69? One. 0 0.25 plus 0 0.4. Zero point six five. Do we all agree? P one of seventy zero point one five plus zero point 
zero point three five. Let's do the same thing for P2. So this is marginal. P2 of 69. What is P2 of 69? 0.4. How did you get it? This one and this one. 0 0.25 plus 0 0.15. 0 0.4. What is P2 of 70. Yeah, 0 0.4 and 0 0.2. 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2, 0 0.6. Let's uh, do some sanity checks. These all sum to 1. This is a probability distribution, so are they, do they sum to 1? It's true that it, they sum to 1, so that's good. This is a marginal distribution, they should also sum to 1. So these two sum to 1, so this is correct. Uh, this is also a marginal distribution, so they should also sum to 1, and they also sum to 1, so I think we are on the right track. All of these seem to make sense. Now we want to find out what's the probability that x2 equals to 70 given x1 equals to 69. So we need the probability of 6970 divided by the p1 of 69. Uh, okay, we need, what is 6970, 0 0.4, 0 0.65. Can someone tell me from calculator how much this, sorry? What is the number, yeah? Okay, 0.615. Okay, what's the conditional? X2 equals to 69 given X1 equals to 69. So this is 0 0.25 over 0 0.65. What is this equal to? 0 0.385. Okay, so what do these conditional distributions mean? If I observe that x1 is 69, 61.5% of the time x2 will be 70 and 38.5% of the time x2 is going to be 69. If I know what value x1 is taking. So given the joint distribution, remember how do we find out the joint distribution? We have the data set, we look at, we create the tuples and then we look at the frequency of those tuples in the data set. That gives me the joint distribution from the joint distribution, I can create the marginals. From the marginals and joint distribution, I can create the conditional distribution. And then the last thing which I wanted to check was the independence. So what is P of 69.69? This is equal to 0 0.25. What is P1 of 69 times P2 of 69? Can someone multiply 0 0.65 and 4? I think it should be 0 0.28. 
Am I right? No. Two six, right? Yeah, two six. So these two are not equal. Therefore, they are not independent. Okay, so the crux of the matter is you give me the data set, okay, you give me the readings, I can compute the joint and then once I compute the joint which is the frequency of these readings coming together, once I compute this joint distribution I can get the marginal distribution, I can get the conditional distribution and I can assess whether or not they are independent random variables or they are dependent random variables. So my car's velocity, your car velocity independent okay because we cannot be dependent however if i am driving right behind you or if i am driving right in front of you our velocities will become correlated so there are situations where things that are uh, not independent become independent or things that are independent become uh, not independent so just something to keep in mind because uh, it'll be i mean even though we may not use this idea too, too many times in this particular course but I think in general in life, it is important to recognize that some things that you expect to be independent can become dependent. I'll give you another example. Uh, whether your house floods or my house floods are generally independent events, okay? Because uh, maybe my, uh, my sewer is backed up or maybe some faucet is turned on or maybe some pipe burst within my apartment and my apartment got uh, flooded but your apartment does not have to have the same set of failures right so it's independent however if it rains heavily in Columbus then my apartment getting flooded and your apartment getting flooded becomes highly correlated event so many of the times uh, so just another tidbit of information not very important for this course but you know what's happening because of the climate change related events is things that were supposed to be independent are becoming dependent. Um, so, if your house burning and my house burning were supposed to be independent events, but now if there is forest fire, it's quite likely that both of our house will burn at the same time, right? So, things that were supposed to be independent are becoming more and more dependent, as a result of which, in some cases, the insurance companies are finding it very difficult to insure houses. So if you go and buy a house in Florida, it's very hard for you to get an insurance, flood insurance for your house, because the hurricanes tend to correlate the flooding event for all the houses. So most of the times, everybody is going to be fine, like 99.9% .9 of the time, but that 0.1% of the time when a hurricane is going to come, uh, the insurance company will go completely bankrupt because they'll have to pay out insurance to every house in the neighborhood. And that creates problems. So, just something to keep in mind that uh, in your modeling, during the modeling time, you might assume things are independent, but make sure you recognize situations where they will become dependent. And then you will have to make sure uh, your systems are designed for handling those dependence. One example, in the early days of Uber, uh, you know the surge pricing of Uber? Are, are you familiar with the surge pricing algorithm? So Uber has the surge pricing algorithm that if there is too much demand and low supply, they'll increase the price of the ride, okay? So this is something that's very well known. Uber was the first one to introduce surge pricing in the transportation industry. So there was a terrorist attack, I think in uh, Australia, some city in Australia, if I'm not mistaken, or there was some attack, there was some event that happened as a result of which a lot of people started calling Uber and the price of the Uber became 6x, the regular prices. And then Uber faced a lot of backlash that why are you charging 6x at the time of an attack? And of course, Uber went back and changed the algorithm after that. So there was no autonomous uh, surge pricing. So then the surge pricing was capped. Uh, they could not just keep going unbounded. And uh, 
And so then, then now what happens? Now what the updated algorithm of Uber is, it'll keep surging. But once it sees that there is a huge influx of demand and low supply, then, they, then there is a human element involved in there, which is going to check what is happening there. If it is a football match at Ohio State University, they'll keep the surge pricing on. If it is a terrorist attack, they'll lower the surge pricing. They'll kill the surge pricing algorithm. So all of those things is something, as a designer of autonomous systems, you need to keep it in mind. So just, uh, I wanted to give you some of these examples so that you are prepared for uh, your career. So thank you so much. I'll see you on Friday. We'll talk about the same thing, but for continuous random variables.